Well, the Israeli war cabinet has decided that there will be a military response to the Iranian attack over the weekend. Iran fired more than 330 missiles and drones fired at Israel, but almost all of them were intercepted. This has led to international leaders calling for a de-escalation of tensions in the region, including our Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron. Here is what the head of the UN had to say during a meeting last night at the Security Council. The Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Now is the time for maximum restraint. We're now delighted to be joined by Defence Editor for The Sun, good friend of the show, J Jerome Starkey. Good morning, Jerome. Um, Jerome, thank you. Um, rhetoric from all sides, international leaders saying, whoa, hold on a second. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Iranian attempt failed, the drones were turned back, the Dome of Steel. I said this earlier, you're the expert, right? Um, it's all games now, isn't it? Does this strengthen Netanyahu with respect? Because he can now say to the Israeli people, they fired inside our territory. There are people saying that's why he did what he did in Damascus. You've got Biden strutting around the world, showing is he a strong leader or what? You've got Iran, who presumably took part in this to, to say to Hamas and the Houthis and Hezbollah, we're with you. Difficult times, difficult times. Well, Jeremy, I think one thing you're absolutely right on is that leaders are often playing to domestic audiences, and so that will explain why Tehran did what it did, and that may well also explain why, you know, the rhetoric in Israel uh, remains, you know, their right to self-defence. And that's being echoed by Israel's allies as well. We heard the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, today saying he supports, or at least he acknowledges, that Israel does have the right to self-defence, but he is urging restraint. Britain is urging restraint. The United States is urging restraint. I mean, let's be very clear. Nobody wants this to spiral no. into World War III, and that is ultimately what's at stake. Israel attacked uh, a consulate building, sovereign Iranian soil, uh, which elicited a huge response from Iran. But Iran clearly appears to have telegraphed its intentions in advance, and that allowed... Israel's allies to prepare what was a formidable defence. I mean, it's extraordinary. We've seen the Royal Air Force mm. uh, engage in the largest air-to-air -air engagement since the Falklands War, shooting down uh, those drones alongside US uh, and French allies. So the message from America, echoed again by Britain today, is take the win. You know, Israel has successfully defended itself. Tehran can, to its domestic audience, say, we have hit back. The world was on a knife edge. Let's try and step back from that knife edge and allow Israel to concentrate on its primary objective since October, which is uh, defeating Hamas. And the world also now trying to continue its pressure on Israel to allow that humanitarian aid in. Warnings today mm. from the UN that half a million people remaining on the brink of famine. I mean, it is catastrophic what has happened, you know, what is happening to civilians mm. inside Gaza. And what if Israel does retaliate? What does mm. that mean for the United Kingdom's relationship with mm. its ally? Well, if Israel retaliates, it depends on how and what they do. But the risk, of course, is this spirals. It becomes a tit for tat, an eye for an eye, until the whole world goes blind. And we are you know, in that scenario where this could quickly escalate mm. into a regional conflict. You know, is, Iran is already in league with Russia. Of course, Russia in Ukraine facing mm -hmm. off against NATO and the West's support. So it doesn't take too many dominoes to fall until this could potentially become a catastrophe, a global catastrophe. Worrying times. So there's Jerome, if you can, let's bring in the legend that is Sun columnist Rod Little. Uh, Rod, welcome. Monday, my favourite time of the day. Uh, so MPs, we're going to shoot through this lot, back from their long, long holiday today. The Middle East, I mean, Cameron's already been out and about this morning, having his say. What's your take on this, my friend? It's going to be central to them. What's your take on it? I think in the, uh, in the short term, I'm listening to what Jerome had to say, but in the short term, uh, and pragmatically, it's very, very good for Israel. There was a danger that Israel was becoming disconnected from all of its allies, which has never happened before properly, um, uh, not through any of the crises which, which Israel has suffered. Uh, but, but the attack from the Iranians has suddenly emboldened in the minds of not just the USA and, uh, and, uh, and the UK, but also uh, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, 
uh, all these countries which which were part of the Abraham Accords, uh, all of those who find themselves on the side of Israel when it's up against the horror that is Iran. So it is, is so it, so it has strengthened Israel's position uh, considerably, I think, in the short term. Um, we will see because Netanyahu uh, is a volatile human being, and it's not possible really to to guess in advance what he will do. Um, were he to launch a, 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 an attack on Iran, I think that uh, we would still stay with him, basically. Um, but, 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 but what it's done in the short term, it's made Israel's position a lot, lot more secure in terms of its relationships with the outside world, uh, in a way which uh, it was terribly, terribly dwindling with the attacks uh, in Gaza and the, and the storming of Rafa, as, uh, as has been planned. Well, Rod, it won't just be uh, the conflict in the Middle East in MPs' inboxes this morning. Their recess is over. Rwanda, oh, Rwanda, unbelievably, is back on the agenda, as is Costa Rica, incredibly. Yeah. Tell can us... I go, please? Well, can I tell I, you that I, on the drive-in this morning, the... Rod, on the drive-in this morning, what? I was half asleep, driving in this morning, sitting in the back seat, opened the Times, and it said, Britain might try to send migrants to Costa. I didn't see Rica. Yeah. I thought they were going to send them to a coffee shop. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was quite. But if they're going to cost, it's been on my bucket list for ages. I can't <laughs> afford Costa Rica. Uh, it's just not on, is it? Uh, je suis Somalian. I want to go to Costa Rica. Um, I, I think it's. I, I think it's a. It's a huge problem for them. Uh, uh, the the policy of my party, incidentally, is to send them to Ascension Island. Uh, now that would be expensive. But the, the crucial thing and the thing which Costa Rica and the various other countries which are mentioned in there um, doesn't do is it takes it out of British control and therefore it, 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 it opens this huge field to the lawyers, the charities, all of whom wish to stop us sending people anywhere, no matter where it is. If you keep it within the British dominion, places that we own, uh, or uh, uh, places which are effectively part of Great Britain, then we have complete control over the process. And I think that's the problem which they ought to be wrestling with. Uh, and But I, I would say again, you know, any one of those countries which have been named in the papers this morning, I'd really like a break. They're warm, pleasant, and you don't have people like David Cameron. Oh, man, you're only on side where it's peeing down. We're only talking to me. Don't be so yeah. miserable. Right, uh, final yeah. thing before we bring Jerome back in. I want to see your face. You ready for this? Angela, it's not going away, is it? Why don't you just release the information and say, I've done nothing wrong because this cloak and dagger stuff, the press ain't going to leave her alone. I think, here's a theory for you, Roderick, right? Roderick, I reckon Starmer's Roderick. loving this, loving it, Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer, this plays right into his hands. Thoughts? I think it probably does. Uh, I don't think they've handled it particularly well. I don't think there is very, very much that can be laid at Angela Rayner's door in terms of the, uh, the the supposed tax evasion. It's not tax evasion. At the very worst, it's about 3,000 quid, according to the New Statesman, which did a pretty forensic investigation of it, um, which may have been uh, uh, unpaid as a, as a consequence of, uh, of a mistake. It's, it's so minor. For me, the, the, as I've said this before, Jeremy, the thing... The thing which is which is the most important thing about this isn't how much money it is. It isn't whether she's defrauded people, which I don't think she has. It's that Labour thing again of, I'll do what I want to do, but I'll tell you what you can do. That's the important thing. The, the, the fact that she doesn't agree with council house sales and would stop council house sales, but would nonetheless buy her own council house and flog it off for a profit. That ties in with all the other stuff we've heard of people like Diane Abbott and uh, Shani Chakrabarti telling us we can't send our kids to private school, but doing so for their kids. Or for Emily Thornbury telling us that we can't send our kids to selective schools, but doing that for her kids. That's, that fits into, the, into a very powerful trope and people hate it. People hate that sort of hypocrisy. And I think that's far more important than you know, the, the sums of money or the idea that it was some kind of chicanery. Rod, and Jerome, oh, just coming to Rod, you for thank the... thank you, my friend. Thank you, Rod. Uh, coming to you for the final word there, back to our top story. Um, obviously, with everything that's happening in the Middle East at the moment, your defence editor. Should we be worried? 
about what's happening right now? I think we should be concerned. Yeah. I think we should be concerned. The world is, is at a very fraught stage of international geopolitics. I mean, it's not just what's happening in the Middle East. I would you know, draw attention to what continues to be happening uh, in Ukraine. And, and the second we take our eyes off that, then that risks becoming even worse. And, you know, you can't forget the threat of what could happen in the Indo-Pacific and, of course, with China's ambitions for Taiwan. So it is a fraught time for the world. And it's a fraught time for those who work in defence. And I'm sure we'll have you back in the next uh, coming Thanks, fortnight. Jerome. Thank you so much, Jerome Starkey and Rod Little from The Sun there.